as we continue to uh, share what's important about life. And last night we learned about bonding, right? Bonding. And tonight we're going to learn about maturity. And uh, one thing about maturity is the fact that while the growing old is natural, right? <laughs> you don't have to do anything about it. While growing old is natural, growing up and mature is not natural, right? And so being able to mature is not a natural thing. Um, you know, you don't just end up, you know, end up being mature all of a sudden. And it takes time and uh, it takes uh, intentionality. Uh, it takes, you know, all that you need to be able to mature. Um, you know, one thing that I want to tell you about maturity Okay, let's see if this works. Okay, great. Okay. One thing that uh, we talked about it last night is the fact that in order for someone to mature, in order for someone to be in a place where he or she can truly, truly like uh, grow in a, in a very powerful way, we need a certain conditioning in our lives. And what's important about our brain is that all of our maturity, all of our growth takes place in our brain. And in our brain, there's four different areas of brain that are called as control center, okay? And the number one, number two, and number three, and number four. As the number grows bigger and, uh, you know, it, it becomes a bigger place for uh, control center. So number four is highest in terms of being able to uh, control the person. Uh, without going any detail, I just want to briefly tell you that when we are conceived in mother's womb, we begin uh, from an attachment level. Uh, it happens in a, in a thalamus, it's a place called thalamus, and then we literally learn to be attached the fetus attached to mother's womb, so to speak. You know what I mean? And that's called attachment uh, in psychology. And, and that attachment is physical, but there is, a, there is a, like a psychological attachment. There's an emotional kind of attachment. And that emotional kind of attachment is called bonding, okay? Bonding that we talked about yesterday. But it literally needs to be attached physically. And that's what we're talking about. And then as you grow a little bit older in, the, in mother's womb, and there's an evaluation level, and you begin to form feelings and, you know, oh, I don't like this, I, I, I hate this, you know, kind of feelings get developed. And then mind get developed, number third. And then what's so important is that as your body, as your brain continues to grow, you got to come to place on a fourth level where you know, one person begins to have a clear idea of who he is and who she is. And it's called what? Identity, okay? And identity is so important. But I want to tell you something about identity. You, we never, uh, we never are, you know, we've never been designed by God to build our identity in vacuum. In other words, you don't go to the desert to discover who you are, so to speak, okay? And you discover the sense of who I am in connection to somebody else. You know what I'm saying? And so that's a very, very important aspect. So I want to tell you, uh, using a psychological term, the, the context, context in which you and I build our own sense of so-called self-identity, self-identity, is in the context of we identity. And to me, this is really significant understanding, okay? In order for me to know who I am, I need to know who I am related to. You know what I mean? And so I discover who I am in relation to my parents, okay? And therefore, even if you sever your relationship with your parents, your parents always stay with you in a sense because you always continue to be affected by them uh, in a way that you define who you are. So who I am is defined by who I am related to. And so we identity is the context in which we discover who I am. So that's why I'm going to talk about, I talked about bonding uh, last night. And what's important is that what gives someone an identity. How, 
you know, whenever I, I find someone, whenever I find someone who doesn't have a um, you know, clear sense of identity, then when you do not have a clear sense of identity as to who I am and who you are, then what's going to happen is that we're going to get into all kinds of dysfunctionalities in our lives. We, we enter into all kinds of dysfunction. See, dysfunction related to what? Lack of identity, okay? And then being able to function, being able to be healthy uh, in our lives uh, has to do with finding health sense, healthy sense of identity. Um, you know, Asians have our own sense of identity in, in the context of we identity. You know what I mean? I am part of the group, and so you identify with the group, and that's how you, you discover your sense of identity. But the problem with this kind of, uh, you know, we-oriented identity, if that's the only thing you have, okay, and I'm part of something bigger, then you're lacking your own self, sense of self-identity. But the problem is, is that, you know, in Asian culture, we take we identity too far, right? In, the, in an effort to bond, and then we lack, you know, individual sense of identity. But we have connection, we have oneness, how we live together. You know, it's like going to Korea, right? You go to Korea, the high rise is everywhere, right? And, and then you go to America, you go to Florida, I mean, not Florida, you go to, uh, what is that, Colorado, it's like high mountain, uh, you know, rocky mountain everywhere. And then you cannot believe that there's houses here and there on top of the mountain. I, but, and then I was joking about it. You know, I bet you that someone who lives up there is not Korean. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's because, because Asians are tending to be, uh, to be collectivistic, being together with other people. But then in an effort to be together, you lack sense of self-identity here. But then on the other hand, in an effort to be independent, Western culture tends to be, I don't know, Australian culture is like that, but Western culture tends to be individualistic, right? Everybody is on their own, and yet there is no sense in which we come together, you know, as, as a we identity. So, so as you can see, human culture, no human culture is perfect because any human culture, you look at it, it is, it is you know, it tends to go to an extreme. All human culture tends to go to an extreme. And that's why I cannot say that my culture is better than yours. You know, when I came from Korea uh, to, the, to the United States at the age of 20, 21, and then my wife went to the United States at the age of 8. And so when we met together, when we met together, uh, her, her Korean was pretty bad, and then my English was pretty bad, right? <laughs> and so that we were teaching, you know, English and Korean uh, to each other, and then what happened was that in our marriage, we had to learn the fact that I'm not here to you know, just like persuade her to give into Korean culture, and vice versa, because no human culture is perfect. Every human culture have a tendency to be extreme, and therefore I cannot promote it as if mine is better than yours, and so forth. You see, and that's an important understanding to have. So, identity to heaven. What defines someone's identity other than being placed in a we identity? I'm going to talk about that tonight, which is really an important aspect, okay? I'm already getting hot. <laughs> I'm going to take off my jacket, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> okay, so far so good, right? Okay, and then let's move on. And then there's a part in our brain that's called identity center, okay? Identity center is, is a center uh, where, where we have it right behind the, the frontal, uh, frontal lobe, okay? And then what's amazing about this identity center, which is in a frontal lobe, is, is that while all the other parts of the brain stop growing, this particular part of the brain continue to grow. It's the only section of the brain that never loses its capacity to grow. Do you like that? There's part of the brain which is called, you know, right inside of the frontal lobe, it's called prefrontal cortex. You touch your head, okay? Touch your head. 
and touch your head if it's still there, okay? <laughs> and when you touch your head right inside of it, there's a part that God designed in such a way that it is called identity center. And that's the center in terms of its capacity. It never, ever stopped growing, amen? And that's amazing, right? And that's why I know that we are created by God to live eternity to eternity. We're not cre created by God just to live momentarily and then die, but we have this brain capacity that allow us to keep growing, continue to grow, okay? And uh, how many of you uh, turn uh, 60? Okay, okay. I want you to know that if you just turn 60, man, raise your hand, be proud of it, okay? How many of you just turn 60? Okay, how many of you are over 60s? Okay, okay, okay. And I want you to know that your life just begun because there was a lady in Florida who just turned 65. She uh, retired. And then as soon as she retired, she knew, she thought that, oh, I'm going to die soon. And then she, she bought a rocking chair. You know that rocking chair can be very dangerous? Because when you start sitting in the rocking chair, you, your brain is in and out, in and out, in and out, okay? And so, so she started going on this rocking chair, okay, after 65, and the little did she know that she turned 90. She turned 90. <laughs> And then she realized that, wow, you know, if I knew that I was going to live like this long, like 65 to 90 is like, what, seven, eight, yeah, 25 years, right? If I had known that, then I would have, like, done something. So then she realizes that, you know what, I may live even 10 years more. Who knows, you know, how many more years I would have. And so she began to attend college at the age of 90. And then she graduated from college. You know, this is a real story. So what I want to tell you is that tonight, your brain has amazing capacity to keep growing, continue to grow. This identity that God has given you is something that's going to grow, um, you know, just eternally. Well, I want to tell you how, how can we grow our strong and healthy sense of identity as to who I am? Okay, that's my question tonight. But... I don't want to make it complicated because it is not a complicated reality because let's take a look at this. How does one grow a healthy and strong sense of identity? Identity is something that you grow when you and I have a sense of being what? Beloved. Okay? So I want you to remember, identity has to do with what? With a sense of being loved. Okay? Come on, you, you repeat after me. So identity has to do with what? Sense of being? Love. Love. Okay, okay, okay. The more you respond, the quicker I finish my talk tonight, okay? Okay, so uh, identity has to do with, with a sense of being beloved. And then, and then my question is, how do I know that I'm loved? All right? How do I know I'm loved? Some people are telling me that I'm not sure. If my husband, my wife loves me, you know, some people are not sure. But I'm going to tell you how in the Word you and I can know for sure that you are loved. How? Ready for this? When you have a sense where there is a love bond that gets created. Love bond gets created. And love bond gets created when there's enough joy bond in your relationship. Okay? Well, there's, there's so much connection between identity and then sense of being beloved and then having a sense of, having a powerful sense of joy bond. And let me explain. Joy bond, well, how do I know that I'm loved? I raised that question. I know that I'm loved because people who love me not just endure me through <laughs> not just love me in a sense where they suffer through it, you know what I mean? But love me in a sense where they enjoy having you in their life. Amen? Yeah. And so when somebody has a joy over you and be so joyous about having you in their life, and then when, you, when that joy gets, uh, gets you know, you know, you know, shared with you, 
then that gives you a sense in which you feel truly loved. And in that place of being loved, we develop a great and strong and healthy and really like powerful sense of having our own identity. So this is an important realization to have. Unfortunately, a lot of people try to build their own sense of identity through a false identity. If there's a true identity, there's false identity. Let me tell you what would create a false identity, okay, before I go on. There are three Ps. There are three Ps that create false identity, which is not a healthy and a real sense of identity, so it's not going to build you up. And it, it makes you feel like you would build a healthy sense of identity by having this 3P, but it is not. What are those? Henry Nouwen talks about it in his book, Here and Now, and also APA Joner talks about it. And also Bible talks about it. And all the wisdom of the word also talks about it. Three Ps are none other than number one, performances. Performances. When you perform things, when you achieve things, we feel like we may have a strong sense of identity. No, it's a false sense of identity. It is, it is superficial. It is outward. And then second P is called popularity. When you have a sense of being popular, you know, and then you feel like you're getting somewhere, you, you, you be somebody, you're an important person, but sense of popularity does not build a healthy, healthy sense of identity. It is still superficial and outward. And then thirdly, what would be the another one? If any one of you can answer that, third P? Power, you got it, you got it, power, okay? <laughs> I didn't share a note with him, even though I stayed at his house. <laughs> and the third P is power. You know, money can be a power, position can be a power, okay, materialistic power, and also physical power, and the sexuality can be a power, okay, your beauty can be a power, right? But what's, the, what's so interesting about this three P the reason why these three Ps are part of the false identity is because your level of performances, your level of popularities, and then your level of power, it is something that is ever-changing, right? Ever-changing. And not only that, all of these things that we are searching after, pursuing after, thinking that you live your entire life to get it and but these are the part of the part of the outward things that will die when you and I die <laughs> all these things will die with us when we die no matter how much you accomplish no matter how much popular you will be people will forget about it too fast no matter how much power we may have it's not going to create a healthy sense of identity because it's not lasting. It will end with our mortality, and, and therefore, this cannot create a healthy sense of identity. And then what creates a healthy sense of identity? To be in a place where you love each other in such a way that you have someone in your life who loves you in such a way that they are joyous over you and you become an apple of their eyes. Like the, how, how the mother or grandfather or grandmother would cherish the child. I haven't yet experienced that, even though my children have married and uh, one of my daughter has two dogs. <laughs> and then my, my, my daughter calls me and said, Dad, come and babysit our dogs. And so I had to adopt them as my grand dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and then, man, I, I ended up loving this dog. Why? Because the more I love this dog, the more it makes my daughter happy. You know what I mean? You know how that is, right? When I treasure this dog, spend time with this dog, praise this dog, man, it makes my daughter so happy, man, dad. 
You're going to be a great grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> Sense of being loved and somebody liking you. Somebody joyous over you. And that is something that, that's more than precious, okay? People need to know. Let's all read it together, everybody. People need to know who they are, and they need to be frequently reminded of who they are by those who love them, right? You see? They need to be reminded. How often? Well, as often as possible. I love you. I treasure you. And then, you know, one time, I, 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 all of a sudden, I look at my daughter, last daughter. She just turned 16. She's pretty tall and growing up. And so then, you know, I kind of, you know, tickle her a little bit on her cheeks. And then, you're still very cute, I said. And then she goes, she was shy, and then, oh, dad. But then yet, there was still a little girl within her, right? My first daughter, as I was driving one day, she already turned 16, and it looked like a you know, lady who's ready to get married. And I looked at her, wow, daughter, because her name is Crystal. I said, you have grown up. And I thought she was going to say, oh, dad, dad, yes, I'm ready to drive, so buy me a car. And that's not what she said. She looked at me, I will never forget. She would look at me and said, Dad, I don't want to grow up. <laughs> I still want to be little kids. I spent a lot of time with seniors in my earlier ministries and then people in their 70s and 80s and I do seminars with them. Funny things happen. When you get older, you know, you lose the sense of like shame, right? You become very courageous, right? And can you imagine like this, 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 this like uh, grandmas would come near me with the bikinis like that and then <laughs> they would come near you and then surround you. Why? Because they want you to hug you. They want me to hug them. I was in my 30s, you know. I was much more handsome back then. But <laughs> And then they want me to hug them and then when I hug them, uh, they're like, oh, they feel so precious. And when I tell them, hey, you still look like... Uh, you know, teenager, and they're like, what do you want? Let me buy for you, you know? <laughs> everybody wants to be treasured, and then everybody, uh, there's a little girl and little boy within them, right? And they want to be treasured, and they need to be reminded every day, and they are loved. What, what kind of relationship we need? Well, we need a real joyful relationship. You know what I mean? We need to be come alive. And so when we eat dinner, how should we eat dinner? Hey, focus on eating, okay? Eat, eat, eat. That's how I grew up. <laughs> but when we eat, we share. When you come into the door, we share. We smile at each other. Yesterday we learned that in one flip second, when you are bonded, you share how many messages? Within one flip second? Six messages. Six messages, okay? We already know. You see, when I meet you, I already know. There's so much energy about this lady. Like, brrr, brrr, right? There's energy goes. Energy comes, you know? With some people, you meet, whoo, energy goes down. <laughs> but we need to be joyous. We need to be joyous. Joy-filled relationship. Not a casual, not a superficial kind of relationship. How are you? Fine, right? When I went to America, I was so moved because every morning I would go to school and people ask me, how are you, how are you, how are you? I said, wow, this is a Christian country. And then one day I decided to play a joke, which is a really bad joke. Don't try it. <laughs> play a joke on them. So people are telling me, how are you? So you know what I said? Don't do that, okay? I said, my mother just passed away. And <laughs> And then the people go, fine, have a great day. <laughs> I, so then I realized that it was not that Christian country. <laughs> and I realized that it was just a cliche. People are just saying, how are you? You're not supposed to say bad, you know, terrible. No, you're supposed to say not bad, fine. You know, go away, fine. <laughs> you see, we're such a superficial culture. People greet each other on the, they don't, you don't greet each other on the, what, elevator, right? When you go into the elevator, what do you do? 
All of a sudden, it's quiet, jam-packed small space. You want to make sure that nobody releases any gas or something, right? I mean, <laughs> And make sure it's going to be painful, right? And then there's somebody always break the silence, right? Isn't the weather wonderful? <laughs> it's not as hot I thought it would be. And then what? Ding! You go out. <laughs> I'm not talking about that kind of superficial kind of relationship, but a real, authentic, and bonded relationship. And that's what we got to create in order for us to be boosted in terms of our identity. New foundation for maturity can be laid when you and I are in that kind of rich and enriching and real and authentic kind of relationship. And therefore, you know, when you go home, when you go home, you see, when I go home, you know, when I go home, my wife and I, we, we are chatting on the phone and, it's fun. I mean, we're looking at each other on the phone, uh, talking to each other. Even though she's in the U.S., I'm here. Try to do that once a day. Um, but, you know, over the years, I've learned that while men are simple-minded in that, you know, when we're tired, we go to sleep, right? But there's something about women. Even when they're tired, they still have things to say before they go to sleep. I mean, if you're tired, like, go to sleep. <laughs> but they need to talk about how tired they are before they go to sleep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so over the years, I've learned that worst thing I can do, I mean, I don't do that every night, but worst thing I can do after I come back from, like, Australia, right? She has so much to hear from me, and I would go home. Last thing I want to do is to go home and Honey, I'm so tired, leave me alone. No, she has so much to hear from me, right? So, so then when, when, me, when I'm waiting, let's say I'm waiting for my wife, right? Then what I do is not to, not to fall down on the mattress. Because once I fall, lie down, what happens? What happens? I'm gone. And if I'm gone, while my wife wanted to talk to me, she would come and she would have to think about, should I kill him or should I wake him up? Or <laughs> How come he is sleeping on me all the time, you know? And, and so over the years, I've learned not to fall asleep, not to, you know, lie down. And so I would stay up. I would pinch myself to stay up. And I want my bride, you know, bride to come. And my bride doesn't come very fast. Fast. It takes a long time. They had to persecute themselves and they do all these things. And then finally she comes, right? And then I ask, well, how are you? That's a wrong question to ask on my part, right? But that's a question she welcomes. And then she starts talking about, there's some men, when it comes to communication, this is so fun. When it comes to communication for men, they go from A to Z right away. I came back from Africa, and I was talking to another man, and then, I, you know, David asked, how was Africa? Great. And then he asked me again, how was Africa? You got to go and experience it. Oh, great, fine. That's the end of our conversation. With my wife, how was Africa? Then I need to start from getting on the airplane. Which airplane? For 60 hours. And then who's sitting next to me? That's an important clue. Who's sitting next to me for 16 hours, right? And what kind of food I eat, right? And how was London Airport was like? You know, all that stuff. And then I need to share, not from A to Z, fine, great. No, that's not the way the woman's brain is wired. And so then I need to go from A to B and B to C. But some, some ladies, you have to go from A to A dash and A. <laughs> and it, and if you think that this is too much, man, we're not ready for a relationship. And this is too much. And, and somebody came up to me, a surgeon came up to me and told me in honesty, you know what, 
being able to emotionally connect with my wife is literally much more difficult than doing the surgery. <laughs> I'd rather go and do the surgery. And, but then we got to learn this because we cannot just say that this is impossible and difficult. A man needs to learn woman's language. Woman also needs to learn man's language. You know, even if you have like 20,000 words to say, when man is like zoned out, like being hungry and all that, you need to say, you need to treat like a dog. I'm sorry. So you need to say, okay, feed, feed him, and then fall asleep, <laughs> let him go to sleep, and then resurrect him later, and you talk to him later, right? Anyway, we need to learn each other's language, which is very, very important. Uh, in, order, in order for maturity to take place, we need to learn how to connect, how to bond, and how to share our communication uh, to be uh, meaningful. Well, you know, that somebody defined maturity as, the, as reaching my God-given potential. And there is no limit as to how much we can grow and mature. My wife is amazing. I often joke about my wife. Uh, I'm more freer to talk about my wife because she's not here, right? But anyway, <laughs> anyway. That's what she get by not coming with me. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that will encourage her to come join with me next time. <laughs> but, but, and then I often choke about my wife because she, she grew up in the United States, but her, 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 her fathers and you know, mothers and grandparents, and they all came from North Korea. And uh, they're not spies, they're fine, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, um, my, my, my wife is amazing in that she knows how to coach me in a way that she never ever be satisfied with the level of accomplishment I have. She always have a way to push me further and further and further. That's amazing. You know why? Because she came from North Korea. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, North Korean inspector is amazing, you know. <laughs> I, God gave me a woman who knew how to stretch me as if I'm a nylon or something, you know? She stretched me, stretched me, stretched me. And then God has a way of stretching me, you know? I, at first I learned how to speak English. And first I learned ministering to Korean American congregation. And the next thing I learned is to minister to multi-ethnic congregation. And the next thing I'm learning is that God is taking me everywhere, all over the world, amen? And even to a point I came to Australia. People think that it's so cool that I, I get to come to Australia and I get, I get to talk about Australia, right? And I saw kangaroo, kangaroo too, you know? <laughs> anyway, try to hop like kangaroo. They have a really tough life, you know, having to like lately. <laughs> Reaching God-given potential. God has a potential for you. And don't ever, ever underestimate what God can do with you and how much we can grow as a person, okay? And grow to maturity has these, you know, levels that we talked about, okay? Bonding needs to be joyous bonding, okay? Not a kind of, you know, like gruesome kind of bonding, okay? It is not a kind, I'm spanking you because I love you, you know? That, you know and not just that kind of bonding, but, but affectionate, affectionate kind of bonding, right? Affectionate kind of bonding that is filled with joy, creates identity, and then in that place of building identity, as we build joy in our relationship, and that's what's going to mature in person. Okay? And so it is amazing how God created a, a sense of maturity in a way that we grow in a what? In a beautiful state. You see? We don't grow in an ugly state. We grow when you and I are in touch with my beauty, the beauty within, beauty in our relationship. You know, beauty in our surrounding. God is a God of beauty. And therefore, we need to, you know, God wants us to mature and grow as we continue to be identified in a joyous relationship. And that is called what? Joy bonding. Okay? Follow after me. Joy bonding. Joy bonding. Joy bonding. Joy bonding. Smile on your face when you say it. Some people are like, joy bonding. <laughs> Whoa, that makes me serious. <laughs> you know, you know I, often, I had a dog by the name of Happy. You know, I, I have a dog by the name of Happy. But, but my, my, my son one day came up to me and asked, you know, told me, Dad, I noticed something. 
Whenever you call our dog happy, you don't sound happy. <laughs> But my dog happy is amazing. Even if I say happy, come here, <laughs> wagging the tail and come. I mean, you know what I mean? Like joy bond. So have a smile on your face when you do that. Okay, look at each other. Look at each other and say joy bond. Joy bond, everybody. Smile on your face. Joy bond. Okay, if the other person doesn't have a joy, giggle them. Giggle them. Allow them to have a joy bond. Okay? Yes, joy bond. There are five levels of maturity, which is going to take five hours to go through. If you want me to spend five hours with you, I can do that, but <laughs> you may never come back. So, okay, five levels of maturity. You start as an infant, and you grow to be a child, and then you continue to grow to be an adult. This is a developmental stage. And then you grow to, you grow to be a parent, and then you become an elder. Elder doesn't mean that you, know, you, are, you become an elderly elder in terms of being a leader for the community. You not only care for yourself, you not only care for your family, not only you care for your children and the family, but you are mindful of the welfare and the vision for the community. And then your, your, your vessel becomes bigger than what you could possibly imagine, and you become a leader uh, for the community and for the society. And one thing interesting about maturity is that there's age factor, but you know, maturity sometimes has nothing to do with age. You know what I mean? Age is almost irrelevant. In other words, you can be a child and you're still mature, and you can be an adult, you can be a parent, and you can be an elderly person, and yet acting like little kids. You know what I mean? How many of you encounter people as they grow older, they act more like childish? Okay, okay. Well, you don't have to tell me who they are, but you know. So, so it is unfortunate that as you grow older, you know, instead of maturing, and we continue to remain in that state of immaturity, right? And so, therefore, there's such thing as child acting like parents, and then parents acting like kids. And it happens when parents need the kids more than the kids need the parents. When our needs are greater than their needs, then something is not going right. But what's interesting about this maturity uh, level is that we all need one another. In other words, we need the immature person to allow us to mature. We need the mature person that would, who would allow us to mature and so forth, okay? Well, let's talk about what happens when we go through an infant stage, okay? What do you notice between father and son? What do you notice there on the, in the picture? Bonding. bonding. It's called what kind of bonding? Joy bonding, joy bonding. Okay, you get it. There's so much joy between father and son. And that's kind of identity that we're talking about. And then when we uh, start out our lives as an infant, zero to three years of age, it is a receiving stage, receiving stage. Follow after me. Uh, follow after me like this, receiving stage. receiving stage. That's a very important understanding. We begin with receiving, okay? You cannot give without receiving, okay? You cannot give what you don't have, and you don't have what you don't receive. So you got to receive it, first of all. And then our human life begins with receiving something from our parents. What, what do we receive? Oh, sorry. What do we receive? Unconditional love. Unconditional love. In other words, despite of one's behavior, Somebody needs to love you unconditionally, regardless of one's behavior. I have a gentleman whom I met not too long ago. It's an amazing, amazing kind of journey that he's been on. He was 13 when he came to know God, and then he just like, you know, ran away from God. He went on his own life, and then what happened was, it was that he ended up being on a street in a beautiful town, beautiful city called San Diego. 
San Diego is a beautiful place, but he ended up being on a street. He ended up shooting himself with drugs. He became alcoholic. He became drug addict, and he was like searching through the rubbish, searching through the trash can to find something to eat. He became degraded. He became nobody. And thank God that despite of how his life was constantly going on a downhill, one thing that he never ever forgotten was to keep asking God to help him. And he said, this is what he said, I never ever allowed my bad behaviors preventing me from coming to God. Amazing? Yeah, he, does, he didn't allow his bad behavior to get in the way of coming to God. So while he was shooting himself, while he was dying on the street, while he was doing, you know, all kinds of like trashy lifestyle, he kept asking, God help me, God help me, God help me, God help me. And then one day, he got this Obama phone <laughs> when Obama was the president of the United States. You know, for the low socioeconomic people, they, you know, government gave them a, a phone, so he calls it Obama phone. And then when he had this Obama phone, somebody called him, and it happens to be his relative. He happened to find out his number, and he happened to call him right when he was just literally was about to die. He was hallucinating he was about to die. And then that relative called him and saved him, and guess what happened? He's at Andrews with me and then studying to be a social worker. And then he broke free from bondage of drug addiction in his life. And then now he's broadcasting with me. He's making videos with me because he can only reach out to his ex-gangs and people on the street, and he knows the slang. He knows how to talk to them and stuff. But one thing I learned from him, he knew about God's love being unconditional in that he believed that no matter how bad he may get in his behavior, nothing, nothing stops from God loving him. Amen? You know, we believe in that kind of God. And when we are a child, when we are an infant, this is a very interesting notion, is that when you are an infant, we have this dependency need. We have a need to be completely dependent on parents for everything. You know what I mean? Can you imagine for a child, like, you know, if I'm cuddling my child, my, my infant child will look at me and say, oh, I think my dad is pretty busy as a pastor, as a, as a clinician. You know what? I better fast for the next couple of days. No. You know, infant has a complete need to be dependent, right? And they need to be cared for. Right? To be fed and then and to be hugged and to be changed and to be comforted and then to put them to sleep and all that stuff. And therefore, we have also have that need to depend on and then we need to do it in a way that, that, that would make us feel secure. When we don't get fed, when you don't get changed, when the diapers are wet, then we don't feel safe and we don't feel cared and we don't feel that someone who's supposed to care for you are not trustworthy. And then this is interesting. Baby, may, infant may cry, infant may, uh, you know, outrageously cry, infant uh, may lose their cool and then just like throw a temper tantrum and whatnot. Can you imagine, while the baby throwing a temper tantrum, mother is also out of her own anger and agitation, throw a temper tantrum to a child. And then being able to deal with the uncontrollable child by an uncontrollable mother, that's unthinkable. So, what the psychologists are saying is that while the baby is uncontrollable, while the baby doesn't have any limit, and while the baby you know, can cry out of nowhere, and then the mother is someone who is able to regulate the joy for the child by being able to caress the child. Oh, honey, 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 it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. 
I will feed you, I'll take care of you. So that the baby can come back to the state of being joyous, isn't it? And so we learn to have joy by someone else who is mature, guiding them, regulating them, and to be in a joyous place. Let's move on. What if you're not cared enough? And this is important. These are the signs that I'm going to share a, a little bit to tell you whether or not I may still remain as an infant. Whoa. Watch out. Take a look at what are some of the signs of us possibly being an adult infant. Okay? Always be needy as adults. If I'm always needy, okay? What happens if I'm always needy? And then what if I, as an adult infant, marries a person? What's going to happen? This is fascinating to me. If I'm needy, always needy, then Ivan Nachi tells me that if I'm needy, I am emotionally on a minus ledger. <laughs> I am minus. It is, like a, a, it is like a jar that is broken. It is like a jar that is leaking. If I'm minus, and then you know, with a minus balance on my emotional bank account, and then if I marry, what kind of notion I would entertain when I marry? Well, my husband, my wife, meet all of my unmet needs of the past. My wife married me thinking that I would meet all of her unmet needs of the past and little did I know that I signed up for it. I felt no problem, I could meet all of your needs. And then, you know, and then she felt like she could meet all of my unmet needs of the past and she signed up for it. And we, each of us, were fooled by each other. And so, I want to tell you tonight, if I am minus on my ledger, then there is nobody in this world who can meet the unmet needs of the past. Ivan Nachi, who is a psychologist, psychoanalysis, are saying that if you're minus going into life, I mean from the childhood and origin, childhood of origin, then you may very well continue to live with the minus balance in your account unless something takes place in your life. And then, what's so crazy about living with minus balance? Are you ready for this? How many of you are not married yet? How many of you are single and be free? <laughs> How many of you are married and be bonded? No, just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Did you know that uh, when you marry, when you are engaged, there's an engagement ring, right? And then when you get married, there's a, you know, there's a marriage ring, right? And then after you, you get this ring from marriage, there's another ring that you receive. It's called suffering. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I don't know what a pessimistic idea about marriage, right? <laughs> okay, okay. So how many have a suffering? Just kidding. Honey. Okay. And then if you are minus going into marriage, okay, I'm going to tell you young people, okay? I'm glad so many young people are here. Uh, if you are going into marriage with the minus balance in your ledger, in your account, emotional account, you have 99.9 percentile to meet somebody with a minus balance as well. Because what is similar is something that allows you to be attracted to. Minus attract minus. Needy person attract what needy person that's why if you and i are stuck in that adult infant stage that's not a time to find another infant to marry <laughs> and then also there is a possibility that you may be plus you may be plus and then you find somebody minus 
Oh, my destiny in life is to save this person. I am the Messiah. I came to save the whole world, but let me start saving this woman and this man in my life. Then what's going to happen is that minus person has a way of sucking your plus energy so much so that you will be drained out to a point where you become minus as well. Unless you continue to get replenished. Anyway, always be needy as an adult. And your needs are not going to be met by yourself because while you are needy, you're not able to take care of yourself emotionally. You see? So, adult infant do not have the ability to what? Take care of themselves. So, if you're hungry, what do you do? All you can say is what? You cannot even verbalize. It's like you throw a temper tantrum. I don't like the weather. You know, I don't like, you know. Have you seen uh, some adults throwing temper tantrum all the time and without saying, hey, I'm mad, but they're like antsy and they went to the wedding, beautiful wedding, beautiful dinner, and then on the way home, let's say, you know, wife goes like, wasn't that a beautiful wedding? What? What was beautiful? You know, that food, $100, it was not worth it. You know, you have this constipating spirit. You know what I mean? Like, oh, oh, constipating. You know? And then you make life miserable. Not able to take care of oneself. You know, one thing that I learned about my life was that my mother died when I was 17. And then, 30 years later, I think 25 years later, to be exact, 25 years later, you know, I was attending and I was, I was doing a uh, you know, psychological study. And then my professor asked me if I had a chance to, like, grieve over the loss of my mom. And so gr having grown up in Korea, having grown up in Asian country, I, I did not know anything about grieving. You know, I cried and that was about it. But then I realized that I buried her in my heart. And then little did I know my mom was such a caring person, very warm and fuzzy person, and then giving person to an expense of not being able to take care of herself. And then little did I know that I ended up, without me realizing, it's all done in an unconscious level, I ended up marrying somebody who is exactly like my mom. Spooky, right? Yeah. And not only that, little did I know that I was always expecting other people to take care of me. I was an adult infant. I didn't realize. And so as I was writing a letter to my mother, I mean, who was already deceased, and I was writing a letter, and to make the long story short, and then what gave me revolution about my own journey of grieving over the loss of my mom was this. This sentence, mother, as the way you mothered me, I am going to mother myself so that you can rest in peace. Learning to mother yourself as you have been mothered, being taken care of, now you're able to take care of others. And if I do not know how to take care of myself, I would expect others to take care of me, right? And then this is important. Infant doesn't know how to express other than throwing temper tantrum, crying and fidgeting and all that. And therefore, adult infant, one of the important characteristics of someone still remaining in that adult infant stage is that they are not able to express themselves. So they have non-verbal expectation is too high. Instead of saying, I am mad, I'm angry, I don't like that. But, you know, you don't know how to express it. And so you try to express it in an indirect manner, and which is not a healthy communication at all. Not able to ask for what they need. Yeah, you're not able to ask for what they need. Hey, I need some help. Instead of getting mad and angry, hey, I need some help. Husband, can you help me? Wife, can you help me? You're not, you're not able to ask, you're not able to. And this is important. 
If, you, if I'm an adult infant in my maturity stage, I am not able to handle criticism. You know, I work with people. I work with a lot of people. I work with graduate students. I work with college students. I work with seminarians who are going to be pastors. I notice something about certain people. They are not able to handle criticism at all. I would like write a letter. I would say things like, you did great and, and, and all that. But there's one thing that you may think about needing to change. And how about this? And how about that? And they take it personal. Either they let go. Either they stop working and they move on. And I try to move on and I said, if you move on from here by taking it personal and then this kind of situation will come up again and again and again, then you're not going to be able to succeed in your career because you're taking things personal too much and you're not able to learn from it. You're not able to grow from it and therefore you're going to remain, you're going to be stuck in the adult infant stage, I tell them. Some people recognize it, and some people are able to deal with it, but some people feel that it's too much. And you, know, you see, you see, you see, if I am criticizing you about your behavior or whatever, about the things that you need to change, then this adult infant tend to think that, oh, this pastor, this Dr. Om is against me, and that's called extreme thinking. You don't criticize someone because you don't like that person. You criticize someone because you care, right? And so we need to learn to handle criticism. How many of you would walk away from this meeting tonight and then say, hey, I learned so much about myself and I need to change? Or how many of you walk away feeling like, oh, I wish my husband should, would be here? How many of you walk away feeling like, I wish my, you know, my spouse would be here? Did you hear? Did you learn? No. It's about me. It's about my, myself. It's about me growing up and, and then, um, and so on. Okay? And then fear bonded and more. let's move on. Okay? And so fear bond dictates joy bond in that you stay in the relationship out of your fear that the person that you're with might reject you, might abandon you, and so on. And that's a fear bond rather than joy bond, okay? Another thing is that if you're an adult infant, I want to tell you some young people here, many of young people here, if you're an adult infant, how do you know that I'm an adult infant? Is that you may be successful in your career, but, okay, you don't have to raise your hand. If you end up moving from one relationship to another, and then that relationship to something else, ever, never being able to establish a closer relationship with somebody, and moving on from one person, jumping from one to another, and so forth, then you may very likely to be an adult infant because you have not learned how to trust and how to endure through the relationship and work the way out and so forth. Child stage. I love this child, right? How he smiles. He's happy with uh, four teeth, right? He's happy, he's happy, he's joyous. You can tell this boy has a, some, some kind of joy bond in his relationship with, with somebody. And then, so as, as an infant, it's a receiving stage. So, you receive love and care, and now when you, become an, when you become a child, 4 to 12 years of age, you're learning to what? Care for self. You're learning to care for self. You only are able to learn to care for self when you are cared, okay? When you receive it, you're able to care for self. Or learning to say what is needed, okay? Learning to say what is needed. Uh, instead of like being mad at, at, at your spouse because he or, she, he, he or she didn't take out the trash. I noticed a lot of couples fighting over the trash. <laughs> you know, one couple came up to me and they said, hey, doctor, who's supposed to take out the trash? And I was laughing at that. You know, is that a real question? <laughs> and then if you're fighting over the trash even before you marry, uh, I'm concerned about your marriage. <laughs> And then, and then they go, no, 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 Pastor, just be serious with us. And they go, in our family, my mother always take out the trash. And that's what, uh, you know, that's what the guy said. And then the lady says that in our family, you know, 
uh, father always take out the trash. <laughs> so who should take out the trash? And you know how I answered? I answered them by saying that, you know, whoever is graced by God, take out the trash. <laughs> okay? And then, you know, it's something that, that you cannot calculate. Uh, learning to say what is needed. You're able to say those things, okay? Husband, I am lonely. Honey, you know, I am isolated. I need support, okay? I am getting sad. You know, you need to be able to talk about what you need. And then still in this stage, you need to be loved, right? And self-expression is very important in this stage. Okay, you need to express what you think, what you feel, what brings satisfaction and expectation. Okay, you're learning to do, in this childhood stage, you're learning to do hard things. That's very important. You need to challenge something that's hard because life is hard. Life is not easy, right? You know, when I came to Andrews, when I came to Andrews to study by myself, my mother gave me a certain amount of money, and then she said, live or die, this is it. <laughs> you go to America, you take care of yourself. Don't ask for money anymore. And so, so I went, and I remember go, going to, you know, going to United States. It was taking forever on an airplane ride. And then my father gave me a letter. And then he told me to read that letter on the airplane. You know, my father never wrote me a letter, and then he wrote that letter to me on the way to the United States. So on the airplane, I was getting kind of anxious and uncertain about the future, unknown word, and then I had little money in my pocket, you know, and first time learning to be independent, right? And then I took out the letter that my father wrote, and I opened the letter. It looks like a Ten Commandments, you know? I'm very short and hit to the point. And the first point is like my father said, beware of woman. <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> and you need to come back, which I failed. <laughs> and, then, and then secondly, be scarce with money because your mother saved up, saved up, even by kneading the, you know, the pants and inside clothes. Um, instead of buying a new one, she would, she would save money in that way, and she gave it to you and be scarce with the way you spend money. And then rest of it, I, I don't remember. Um, but, you know, you become so uncertain about your future, and then, you know, and then I realized that, oh, wow, life is going to be something else. Life is going to be difficult. And then one day, I was on the way to school, where we live in Michigan, there's a lot, lots of snow. Right now, there's a weather forecast that there might be snow this weekend. Uh, can you imagine that? And then our, our area is the snow dumping ground. Because what happened is that there's uh, great lakes, you know, five great lakes ahead of us. And then when the great lakes, the moisture comes up from the lake, when it, when it matches with the cold air coming from Canada, and then it's a perfect match for creating a massive amount of snow. And then our house is a dumping ground right there, right? And so then one day I was just riding my bike to school while I was wearing the you know, clothes that my father sent me. And I could only see outside like this. And I was riding my bike. And then next to me, like the people riding their car, passing by. And then thank goodness that they were showering the snow on me as I was riding. And then I was like sleeking and, you know, slippering and all that. And as I was going, and then, you know, I began to get emotional. And then um, I began to like teared up in my eyes, right? And then I got teared up. And then, oh man, why do I struggle so much in the United States? Why didn't I stay back? And then one thing that dawned on me is that, you know what? You are struggling because it's difficult, right? If it is easy, you don't want to try it. Since it is difficult, you're trying it. And then wait until it gets easier, then you would, you would have grown that much. You see, being able to try something difficult and hard. You know, I got into ministry working for young people in a church, um, you know, with speaking English. When I came to the United States at the age of 20, it was difficult. I remember, uh, you know, being a pastor of a church, first time being a pastor of an English church. And I was preaching. I was teaching. 
And then there was a little girl who was literally like seven years old girl, okay, who was sitting down taking notes. And I was like, wow, I was amazed that this girl is taking notes of my sermon. You know, so I was impressed. And then little did I know that after the sermon was over, she came up to me and said, little girl, right? Yeah, pastor, your pronunciation is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and then she goes, you need my help. <laughs> and then during your sermon, you have made 20 mistakes. <laughs> and then these are the mistakes that you made. <laughs> I almost wanted to crush her. Uh, okay, you become non-existent, okay? <laughs> but then, not to remain as an as adult infant, I had to learn how to take criticism well, right? And then this girl, smart girl, start teaching me how to pronounce better. One of the hardest pronunciation I, have, I had ever tried was like, film. You know, you know I used to use the saying, Pillum, pillum, pillum. And she was like, film, film. Try again, film. Don't give up. Try again, film, film, film. I was like, whoa! <laughs> Learning to try something hard. And then I said to myself, I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to try English pastoring ministry. I'm going to try until it works for me until it works, until I become powerful, until it becomes second nature. I'm going to keep trying, keep trying, and keep trying. I'm still trying. And so try something hard. That's part of being a child. And, and when you do that, it's going to extend yourself. Develop personal talents and resources. These are the time when you develop personal talents and resources. Self-care is very important. Yeah. Knowing yourself and making yourself understandable to other people, it's important. Children understand the big picture of life. This is also important. You know, when you go through childhood stage, it is important for a child to have a worldview. One time I was talking about God's plan for this world and, you know, God's will for us and all that. I remember one daughter, my daughter, Crystal, came up to me and said, Dad, Thank you for teaching me, you know, about this thing. And then she goes, you know, I understand. I understood that I have a universal significance over my life. You see, kids, kids at this age, you know, they need to learn what life is all about, you know, and what, what, what's significant in their lives and so forth. Well, when you stay as an adult infant, what happened? An adult child, okay? Which means that adult infant is the one who didn't receive the care that they needed to receive. And then adult child is the one, okay, who didn't receive what they needed. And therefore, they think in their mind that I'm the only one who could take care of myself. Nobody else. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So then when you are not cared for, then you become what? You become so selfish about everything and you become egotistic. You become self-centered. You know, you become narcissist. This is what I'm talking about. Adult body, but emotionally at a child level of maturity. Then what happened? Then you become egotistic and then what else happened? Can only take care of self in an expense of what? Other people. Yeah, you're not going to be able to, right, you're not able to bring food for the potluck, but you want to make sure that you got to eat, you know, and before everybody else, and you got to eat more, and, and you become selfish, and then, you know, like we treat a lot of college students. Well, amazing thing is that some college students, they graduate, and they move on, and as they move on, one, one college student ended up giving like $200 for church, the pastor, I've been fed freely so much for the past four years. This is a little money, but I can give you. I can give it to the church. You see, that's called maturity. But there's a one, one person who graduated, who ended up living there, and yet not being able to contribute at all. You don't want to be judgmental, but if you 
continue to use your resources only to benefit yourself without being able to benefit other people, then you may, may very likely to become an egotistic and adult infant. Adult child looks like something like this. You have never grown up. Mom and dad still checking up on you, and you're still reading bedtime stories and teddy bears with you. And then this is adult child, okay? And then this is adult child. Life is about play and having fun, and you're 20 years old, 30 years old, and 40 years old, you're still acting like kids and irresponsible. You see, I want you to know that you know, when you are a kid, that's the only time you can enjoy being irresponsible. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the only little window of you know, space where you can do that. But as you grow older, you can afford, you know, uh, you can afford not being uh, responsible, not being irresponsible. And then this is adult, adult child, you know? And this is more complicated. Part of you is, is an adult on the other side, and then part of you is, is, a, is a child, you know, infant and child. And it's a very complicated place. And this is interesting how the child ended up taking care of the mother, so then you become parentified as a kid. You're still a kid, but you're having to take care of the mother. You see, a lot of kids who grew up in a family where parents are fighting all the time, I remember hearing a story about, about parents in the, you know, who always fight while they drive. Can you imagine driving 60 miles an hour and they're fighting, mother and father are fighting, and the daughter is sitting in the back seat trying to reconcile referee between the two, and mother tried to, out of anger, try to open the door, try to get out of the car to die. And you're just kind of in between and anxious about everything, and then you're having to take care of the welfare of your parents. And then no wonder, she grew up with anger, she grew up with uh, actually emptiness and sadness in that, you see, when a child grow up uh, in a place where you lose your childhood, when you lose your childhood, where you can enjoy your childhood, you know what I mean? When you lose that chance of being a child, there's an emptiness that gets created, and then there's a sadness that gets created, and also with that sadness, there's an anger that, that com compounds with it, and then that becomes a source for what? All kinds of addictions you know, in our lives. And then study shows, study shows that one of the most important reasons for people being in a place of addiction is nothing else but what? But lack of bonding in their relationship with their parents and with the significant others in their lives. When that hole gets created, you try to fill it with something that can never, ever be satisfied. You see? And I want to end with this note in that Yeah, I'm going to stop here, and then I'm going to talk about something. We don't have time to go through entire in its entirety, so I'm going to talk about something, and that's going to be meaningful to all of us. And I'm going to, I'm going to end, uh, you know, not too soon, but I'm going to give you something. What helps me to realize is that we as a human being, as we, as we grow up, all of us are in a place where we all are broken people. One way or the other, you know, we all are broken people. We don't get the kind of care and affection and attention that we need as a child growing up uh, in, such, in such a way that we become broken in our being, in our relationship to one another. And like I said yesterday, I didn't know that I was broken until I turned, you know, my 30s. But then, but then I had an experience where I experienced brokenness in a, in a deeper way, and yet it didn't hit me at that moment. It was when my mother died. And when my mother died, when I was 17 years old, and my mother was 41 years old. And then when she died, um, you know, that was my first exposure to death. And I had no idea 
you know, how to, how to move on without my, without my mom. And since I have younger brother, youngest brother was 12 years old, and my, my sister was in between, and so then my father ended up remarried. And my new mother came in to my house, and then we had a hard time calling her mother because I was 17 years old, my brother sister was 13, and my brother was 12. And so we all had a hard time calling her mother, and yet my mother had a rice pot, you know, if you know Korean family, my mother had a rice pot, and whenever we finished the rice bowl, and we would ask her, right, give me more rice, right? If my mother was alive, we would call her like, mother, give me more rice. But then we would like, Call, give, give our rice bowl to her just like a beggar and give me more rice, you know, <laughs> you know without calling her mother. <laughs> and so one day I called up my brother and sister and then I said, you know what, my mother came to our house, she's working really hard and so from tonight we're going to call her mother, okay? I'm going to start calling her mother and you need to follow after me by calling her mother. If you don't, I'm going to kill you guys, Okay. <laughs> I was not a violent person, but, you know, that's how it worked back then. It's all about killing. It's all, no, just kidding. But anyway, so, so that night, that night, I was picking up rice, leftover rice. You know, I had like three of them left. I picking them up with my chopstick one by one. I was trying to muster courage to say, mother, if you haven't experienced it, you don't know what I'm talking about. And so finally... I ate my final, <laughs> you know, kernel of rice, <laughs> and then I finished it, and then my sister and brother, they were looking at me, like, you can't do that, you can't do that. <laughs> and then I look at them, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and then I muster courage, and then I look at my mom, and I don't know how I did it, I said, Amma in Korean, mother, Amma, give me rice. And then when, as soon as I uttered the word Amma, my mother's, you know, eyesight was like wide open, twinkle, and then she gave me lots of rice. <laughs> and then I look at my brother and sister, you better call her mother, otherwise I'm going to uh, kill you. And that night, all of us called her mother, and the next night, my father was gone. As I was growing up, when my father was gone, it was the day of freedom, you know? And my father was gone, and my mother was there, and then we were singing and praying and we were worshiping together. And then all of a sudden, my mother started to cry. And so out of obedience, I started to cry. And then when I started to cry, my brother and sister, out of fear, they started to cry. <laughs> and so we were all crying. And then as, as we were crying, like we became very awkward. And then, and then all of a sudden, my mother goes, I know why you cried. You cry because you're crying over the loss of your mother. You know, I cry because I cried over the loss of my marriage. I was left with my wife, my, left with three children, having to raise them by myself when my husband ran away with other women. It was the most difficult time of my life. Look at my hands. And then she said, you know, your life is broken. Your lives are broken because the passing of your mother. My lives are broken for a different reason, but you and I are all broken people. And then she goes, I will never ever forget. She said, you and I are like a broken jar and that our dreams have been broken. Our dreams of having a perfect family is broken. And yet, when God comes, he knows how to use the crazy glue of love <laughs> and then being able to put all those broken pieces together, then we become a jar that is stronger than, than it was, even before it was broken. We become stronger than ever. Amen? Yeah. And then she goes like, you know, we're going to be stronger than ever and before. You know, I want to tell you tonight is that being a human is to feel, is to be broken. You see, all of us are broken one way or the other, and we are weak people. 
You know, we are weak to a point where we cannot save ourselves. We are weak to a point where we cannot save ourselves, especially when it comes to addictions in our lives. We cannot, I cannot. One of, the one of the symptoms of addiction is when people think that, oh yeah, no problem, I can overcome it. No way, no way. I cannot overcome the power of addiction in our lives. I met this one man who's been addicted for something. And he's the father of a little girl who was just born. His wife has been really dealing with him for a long time. And in fact, this person is in ministry, is, is working with young people. And then he could no longer work with young people because of the addiction in his life. And so then, instead of teaching him, instead of cutting him off, I gave him an opportunity to go somewhere to be healed. Because I've dealt with addiction in my life, in the lives of people so many times, because addiction is something that you cannot help yourself. It, it literally takes 24-7 supervision in your life. I cannot do that, right? And so, you know what I did? I told that gentleman, is that if you want to be healed, if you want to get better, if you want to be restored, I want you to check yourself in to a rehab. There's a rehab in California called Dream Center. It's a powerful place. It was, it's studied by a lady, you know, senior citizen who had a passion for community and started out helping people in her garage and it ended up becoming a $10 million, uh, you know, uh, facilities and building. Amazing place. Thousand people came from all over the world. It is a place where you can go to get healed, but literally it is almost like a jail. <laughs> You know, you go there and check yourself in, and then they check you everything, three hours of Bible study, six hours of working there, and so forth. And then, guess what? Hundreds of people went in there. Only, you know how many people get better? Only 1% of people. And so, I persuaded him, you know, through God's help. And then his wife joined the wagon with me in persuading him. I ended up finding someone who could help him to, to join with me, to persuade him. And then guess what happened? He said one day, Pastor, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to check myself in and to restore myself and to help bring my family together. And then he called me up one day. He said, Pastor, can you take me there? It was in California. I was in Michigan, right? He said, can you take me there? I said, no way. I, I don't think I can take you there. I'm in Michigan. You're going to be in California. And then I, so I said no. And then after I said no, I look at my calendar. Sure enough, the time when he was going to need my, my ride I was supposed to go out there in California. <laughs> so I called him up and said, oh, sure, I'm going to be out there. I'm going to be out there. And then, and then so I went, and then I picked him up from the airport. Can you imagine? Because, you know, when you check yourself in, it doesn't happen until you really get there, right? And so sure enough, he came. I picked him up, and he loves Korean food. You know, nobody doesn't like Korean food, right? And so he loves Korean food, so I took him to Korean restaurant. I said, this is all you can eat. Because you're not going to be able to eat Korean food for the next one year, okay? <laughs> and so he was eating Korean food, and I took him to Dream Center. I would never forget. Before he checked himself in, I said, I want you to be part of 1%. Part of 1%. Stay there. Hang in there. Keep it up till the end. You need this system to help you. Because no one else can help. This system, you need the system 24-7. And he goes, yes. And then right before he checked himself in, he took out his cell phone, cheap his cell phone that he had. He was crushing it with his hand. <laughs> I know that I'm not allowed to have this phone. So he was crushing his phone. And he went in there. And then guess what? Last June of this year, he and his wife and his daughter came and see me. And we had dinner together. 
because he went through that program and he survived and he was able to overcome it by the help of God, by the help of system. And he came out, he's learning to mature. And before he didn't care about anything, he only cared about himself. He was an adult child. He, took, he tried to meet his wants in an expense of destroying the family. And then now, man, he was being kind to his daughter. He was showing his affection to his daughter. And he was telling his wife he loves her. And he has sparks in his eyes about his future. You see, maturity is possible. Being able to mature is a possibility, but it, it's not easy. It doesn't happen easily. It doesn't happen naturally. We need outside of help in times of our needs. We really do. You know, I dealt with people on the street for the past three years in my life, in the streets of Los Angeles, California. I met with all kinds of people. And then out of all that, two people came out being cleaned. Why? Because they were able to seek out help. They were able to use the resources that were outside of them. And I want to tell you something tonight. There are times in our lives that we may be in a place where we don't have resource within. We may need to seek out the resource outside of us. It takes courage. It takes efforts. It takes strength on our parts. And when we do that, then we come to a place where we experience, you know, true transformations in our lives. And I want to tell you something before we end, is that one of the greatest allies for shame in our lives, when you and I have shame in our lives, do you know what shame loves to hang around with? In order to continue with shame in our lives, Shame loves secrecy. As long as you keep things secret, then you're going to continue to faster and grow in a place of shame. Shame will grow as you grow in your secrecy. But what's so amazing is that when you begin to open up and say, hey, I'm immature, I need to mature, I need to change, and I have addiction in my life, and I have problems in my life that I cannot resolve on my own, and when you do that, you become open, you see? One lady came up to me and said, Doctor, my husband has a problem with, you know, violence. This lady was pregnant with a child. My husband was violent. On the way to church, my husband hit me. You know, what do I do, Pastor? What do I do? Help me. Guess what I did? I said, shame loves secrecy. As long as we keep secret, we're going to continue to faster you know, shame. So I have to make it open without, without advertising it to the rest of the world. So what I did was to tell his boss, <laughs> you know, his conference president, his boss. I talked to him, got him in, and made it open, and then found out that this gentleman, this pastor, has such an such a issue with anger with his father. And then he also was the one who had been, you know, abused by his father. And then tremendous anger. And he was getting help. He got help. He started to change in his life. And then little did I know that a couple of years later I met them. And then I found out that their relationship got healed and the child is growing up happy and joyous. But we need outside help. You know, I don't know about, I don't know about Australian culture, but even in Korean culture, it's like if you seek out help, if you go to a counselor, if you go to a pastor for help, it's almost like you need to have a mental issue to go there. Right? But it's not like that. You know, I met my daughter, my last one. She's a teacher, and she's a you know, vice principal. And then one day she called me up and said, Dad, I'm in counseling. I said, what kind of problem you have? You need counseling. 
<laughs> Even though I'm a pastor, I'm a counselor. And then she goes, no, no, dad, shame on you, dad. You know, you know everyone needs counseling. So she and her husband, they would go counseling and they would learn things. And then one day we all together and my wife and I had a little bit of disagreement and we had some little bit of like disagreement, a heated moment in our relationship. And then I found my daughter and my, my daughter and my, 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 my son-in-law and they came and they were trying to counsel us and they're trying to coach us as to what to do. You see, everyone, everyone needs to be in a place where we get guided by somebody else. It's easy for us to go to God and, and get help, but it's harder for us to go to someone else, human being, to receive help and to receive counsel, you see? And therefore, I would like to really challenge each and every one of us. If there is a problem in your family, if there's a challenge in your family, don't try to keep it within. I've seen families that keeping the dysfunctions and, and struggles and challenges in their lives, like keeping it within them for like what? So many years and then and it gets worse and worse and worse. Make it open, talk to someone, come to me if you need to because I'm not gonna stay here, I'm gonna leave, right? I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna be gone, so you can talk to me, right? Yeah, <laughs> I will walk away from here, but I'm gonna leave you with something, strategy that you need, you see? So we helped that person out in our ministry. That was a huge deal for us. And I have three people in my ministry right now. One person is about to get divorced. They came to me, when they came to me, man, they're multiple, just so, so much problem. And I could almost tell them that this is impossible. But you know what? When they seek out help from outside of them, when they seek out help from God, you see, God always brings a, ch a chance to have a breakthrough in their lives. And I'm going to end with this note, that where do we find breakthrough in our lives? In a place of breakdown. So if you have breakdown in your life, that's where we can have breakthrough. Okay? So take courage. Your life meant for something greater and your family meant for something greater, your marriage meant for something greater. You see, the problem with our lives is that sometimes we live with our dysfunction, we live what, with our unhealthy patterns of life in a way that we allow that to continue, and as long as we allow that to continue, two things happen. We build tolerance, and then secondly, what's abnormal become normalized. And so it's important for us to gain a perspective, new perspective with someone who has been in this field of expertise and so forth. I'm not claiming that I know everything, but I came here uh, to be with you, to be open with you. And thank you for some of you being open with me. And I really appreciate that. And, and I, I really treasure that. And I hope and pray that this weekend, uh, to, from tomorrow night on, um, you know, we'll continue to be in a place where we grow in our ability uh, to bring transformation uh, in our relationship because all of us need to be in a joyous relationship. Amen? Amen? All of us need that, okay? God bless each and every one of us. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us tonight. And I pray that you would help us to, to learn and what it means to restore the sense of joy in our lives, in that we would continue to grow and mature and, and continue to blossom in our relationship with ourselves and in our relationship with others, in a way that we become a source of joy in the lives of other people because there's a river of joy running in our hearts. And may you bless us in an abundant way as we continue to grow in you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see you tomorrow night and onward.